Hello all. I hope everybody uh, got back from the lunch. And now it is the time for us to uh, resume the session. <coughs> So I'm sharing my screen and would like to know when screen is just right. Your hands if it has reached to you. That's great, Manoj. Thanks. OK. Uh, so, uh, just one more activity before I can conclude uh, this supportless school too. There are people who will begin with a dedicated school too. Uh, in the Q&A, I got a question uh, about uh, secondary storage. Okay, so here we already have created, or it has created a primary storage for us. Now it is the time for me to add a secondary storage here. OK, so for secondary storage, what I did in the break time, I created one secondary storage. This is a ordinary blob storage what I have created. So here it is. OK, and I created one data container there and inside the data container, I have uploaded one CSV file. So this is a separate uh, blob storage I have created and I want it to add as a secondary storage. Remember, in the LF scenarios, you will not keep your data in the primary storage. The major reason is your data is too large to accommodate into primary storage. That is one thing. And secondary, the second thing is anyway, you will limit your primary storage or you will reserve your primary storage uh, for uh, holding all you know business uh, artifacts of the workspace. OK. So you ideally will have a separate storage where you will keep your data. So thereby, I already have created a separate storage with the name Chandra RDP 203 store, and this separate storage I would like to add as a secondary storage. In this storage, I already have created one data container. Here is the data container name, and I already have uploaded one CSV file. So with that now, I want to add a secondary storage. So here I click on plus sign. Connect to the external data. As you are a blob storage. Continue. Here it is asking me to connect to that uh, storage, so asking me to mention the name of the link service. So link service basically is a, is a kind of an object which holds all necessary information, including authentication information to connect to the data source. I normally prefer giving appropriate naming convention to it. So link, blob, and what is the name of the blob? Its name is Chandra DP203 store. So I mention here name of the blob, Chandra DP203. I know name of the blob all lowercase letters, okay? But here it allows me to mention it. Uh, using uppercase characters also, so I took that opportunity. Auto resolve integration runtime, everybody knows that uh, you know it is a kind of a, a driver. Uh, it will automatically select to connect synapse to the blob storage. Okay, other things I am giving here, like uh, subscription, storage account name. So here is the storage account name. OK, and thereby let me click on the test connection. What it did is in this link service, it has loaded access key automatically from that storage. So this link service not only has the name of the storage, it also has an access key of the storage. OK, so let me check whether my configuration is correct or not by clicking on test connection and it is correct. It means this link service has got all necessary information uh, to connect to the storage account. Finally, let me ask it to create. So it has created a link service successfully created. OK, let me just uh, 
click here to refresh the things so that it will refresh all the things. And here now it has to show me name of the block storage. And from here, you know, we can navigate to the block storage. Now this is secondary storage, so we can navigate to the block storage. So here you can see data is a container there. And inside that data container, now it has to show me loan data order CSV is also existing. I want to uh, write a query on this to access. So I am right clicking on that uh, file name and I am asking it to select Android rules from that file. And here you will see it has written a command for me. It has written a code for me to read the data from that file. File name is appearing here. Uh, container name is appearing here. Storage name is appearing here. And this is clearly mentioning that it is not a primary storage. Format is CSV, part version, and other things are there. You know, let me select this and let me put it uh, to run. And there you will see. Used by another process. OK. I think one more uh, thing I did. Let me provide it a public access as of now. I am just avoiding going into you know, further uh, uh, complexities like declaring uh, other objects authentication for authentication purpose that I am avoiding to do. OK, so what I do is I go to that storage and I make that data container as a publicly accessible. So here I am declaring it. Ideally, what I should do, I should create other objects, OK, uh, like external storage and other things. OK, then it will become accessible to me. So I have changed its access and now let me put it to run. And then thereby it has to show me the data. Here is the data. It has collected or it has chosen. <laughs> <clears throat> the first row as a part of the data. Ideally, I should ask it uh, to refer to the second row uh, to get the data from. OK, so for that purpose, again, I will have to do some of the settings like the first row. So in case if I mention here. First row is equal to two. It means thereby I will ask it to go to the row number two. Uh, to pull the data from. Thereby it will ignore the first row. OK, and it will consider actual data from the second row. So with that, when I put it to run. Uh, here it is giving me actual data. Now by default it is giving some column names. If I want to even uh, you know change those column names and if I want to you know, give my schema. OK, this is the way to do that. So here we are pulling the data from CSV file. OK, and we are querying a CSV file also. Here I will ask it to name the. Second column as a loan ID. What is second column? Let me show. Here is the second. So that two means column number. Fourth column. Sorry, third column is gender. Fourth column is marital. Sixth column, I am dropping fifth column. So hereby I am deciding a schema for me. OK, and I am also deciding. Uh, yes, schema means column names as well as column types. I am deciding. So this is the way to declare a schema. Let me put it to run and let us see how does it show me the schema. On this CSV file, Loan data not found. Reference external storage. Loan data not found. Where I am mentioning the name loan data. Acha data source. Okay, okay. Anyway, 
I will have to declare a data source with the name loan data. Let me just quickly declare it. OK, that is an object. OK, if you recall earlier also, I created such an object. OK, so this is a statement to create. Uh, just not this one. Okay, here is a uh, statement to create loan data. So we can ask it to create a loan data. OK, uh, loan data as a you know, data source. Uh, OK, and I can ask it. To create a loan data. Uh, as a data source on this uh, storage. OK, uh, with a data as a container. OK, so I can ask it to create an external story a data source also. With the name say loan data. And then. Uh, oh. OK, I will have to connect to the database. Some small mistakes I did commit here. OK, now I will ask it to create a loan data object. It has been created and now this query, you know, which will query the CSV file. And here it will bring that data for me. OK, so loan data object uh, external data source got created and on the external data source. You know, I am doing a query. So this is the way you know uh, we can even query a CSV file uh, also. So there may be uh, so select uh, query semantic what they are following, but there may be a couple of new clauses like you know function name, open row data set. But otherwise, in case if you are coming from an you know, SQL development background, then uh, you can align yourself with its uh, uh, simple semantic, and you can write a queries on that. OK, so by using these queries, not only you can do interactive uh, working with uh, uh, non queryable data sets, OK, but you can get a page the data into Databricks. You can fetch it into uh, other services also, not Databricks or Chile, Spark notebooks and other services also. So this is the way to uh, actually ingest the data. So that's all about uh, Serverless SQL pool, and now it is a uh, time for me to discuss dedicated SQL pool. Before I go ahead uh, for the dedicated SQL pool, okay, just would like to know whether you have any question on serverless SQL. Okay, it seems there is no question on serverless. Open row set and bulk are serverless keywords. Yes, yes. Open row set is a function that is being used there, and bulk is a uh, parametric value. Okay, that we have to mention to it. And these are standard uh, parametric values. Okay, you cannot do any change to them. These values you can change, but these are all parametric values. Select top. These are all reservoirs they are giving from, with, as rows. As rows will give me uh, data in the tabular form. So these are a couple of reservoirs they are giving. Those we will have to follow. Uh, yes, I can say these are as of now specific to Synapse. The reason is that the concept of a serverless SQL is there in Synapse. OK, and this kind of you know semantic they have followed. So this semantic is not a kind of a standard. Okay, that is a point to be noted. This semantic is not a kind of a standard. OK. So now let us go to understand data warehousing. So for that purpose, what I do? I have to create a dedicated SQL book. These scripts let me close now. So let me close these scripts. OK, and now I go to create a dedicated SQL book. So here is an option available in the manager section. You will see in analytics tool SQL pools. OK, uh, this entry you will always see there because this is serverless SQL pool. And when and then you want to create a new SQL pool, it is going to create only and only dedicated SQL pool for you. OK, so here it is asking me name of the dedicated SQL. Pool. Now here you one more thing you remember. 
that whatever name we will give to this pool, it is going to create a database of the same name. So always remember, for a dedicated SQL pool, there is always one database. So in dedicated SQL pool, you can create at least and at most one database. So if you want to deal with the two databases, you will have to create two different dedicated SQL pools. So here I may be giving a name as Chandra dedicated. And then here it is asking me to submit data warehousing units. I already discussed about it. Larger is the value, more resources it will pump in. I go with minimum because I know, you know, if I keep it minimum, the cost what I will have to bear is very low. See here, if I increase it, it is increasing the cost. If I reduce it, you know, a hundred C possible. We can go with a hundred C also, but I take it to 200 because I, I will get an opportunity to upload more data there. So I'm going with a 200 C. After this additional settings, there is nothing I can, uh, collating sequence I can declare from here. Okay, otherwise I will have to click on review plus create and it is going to create one cluster and uh, uh, having uh, the capacity of 200 data warehouse units. So for 200 data warehouse, uh, data warehousing units, I can tell you the size of the cluster. For 200 data warehousing units, its size will be only one node. So that single node will work as a cluster. That single node will work as a master node and it itself will work as a worker node. Okay, so both way it is going to work. Whenever I assume, say, uh, assign 1000 data warehousing units, at least 1000 data warehousing units, then it will create a scalable cluster of which a size can automatically grow. But below 1000 uh, data warehousing units, it will be giving me non-scalable single node cluster. So I'm clicking on create and it will start creating data warehouse of single node. Whenever you will work, you know, look, looking at the size of the data you will and looking at the performance that you need, you will decide the data warehousing units. This is a, a only training and whenever you are learning, you will better uh, go with minimum resources. OK, so it has started a deployment and soon it will uh, create the cluster. In the meantime, let me explain you how such cluster you know, works. Uh, how we, so what is its architecture? Just to, huh. <laughs> OK, I don't have sufficient space now, so let me save this and uh, also note that these uh, uh, so notes I will share with you by end of the session. I will share these notes with you with the hope that it will be useful for you. OK, let me discuss the architecture in the meantime. You know, let me just check whether you know, it is still under provisioning. OK, so uh, uh, here how this architecture is, let me explain you. OK, there is something called as a control node. There is something called as a control node. OK, this control node is responsible for request, uh, receiving every query. OK, whenever you submit the query, that comes to the control node. So this is 
control node. OK, then what is does is what this control node does that it creates an execution plan of the means it compiles that query. So here is a query what it will receive. It will receive the query. And the control node only will return the response. OK, so nobody or no query can be directly given to any of the worker node. You know, request and response will happen with the control node only. And now these are the worker nodes. Okay. Now in the cluster. OK, and here is the data say. Let me represent data in the blue color. Here is the data. What happens here in these nodes is your data gets partitioned. OK, so maybe. You know, as there are four nodes, so here I am showing you four partitions. The first partition goes to. One of the worker node, another partition goes to. So your whole data has been divided into four parts. Whole data has been divided into four parts. OK, and then these four parts are moved to four worker nodes. So let me represent them as a. Worker node, so W1. Here is a, another worker node. Uh, let me do one thing. Let me change its color to green. So worker nodes are representing computes. So let me show them with a different color. W3. So every worker node is capable of running every type of query. But what how they are different then? That they are receiving different data sets. Now, whenever you are receiving one query, say here is a query what you are receiving. You want a query. So that query will be compiled here. Its ex execution plan will be created. Compile. Execution plan. And the execution plan will be submitted to every worker. So that will be submitted to. This worker node. This worker node. This worker node. This worker node and this one. So same execution plan is submitted to all the worker nodes. Same execution plan, same query. Every worker node is going to execute, but their data sets will be different. So every worker node will run the same query on different data sets and will send responses back. So it will receive responses from this worker node. It will receive response from this worker node. It will receive response from this worker node and it will receive response from this worker. So in short, let me just mention here that this is exact plan. Exec plan. OK, and these are responses. These are responses. Those responses now are to be accumulated here. In the control node and then those responses will be sent back. Accumulated responses will be sent back from here. Responses. That is how you know. Uh, parallel processing works here. This is called as a massive parallel processing architecture. Massive parallel processing architecture. Massive parallel processing architecture. OK, yes, a dedicated SQL pool has been created and the moment it has been created, it started. Billing me. Now here, if you see, 
on these three dots, there is an option pause, scale, or delete. So whenever you are pausing it, you know what it does is it uh, now it is your uh, dedicated SQL pool is with two things. One is it is with a storage, and second is it is it is the compute. So storage and compute. Whenever you pause it, your compute gets paused, and thereby you stop billing on the compute. You are stopped for billing on the compute. Okay, and whenever you delete, not only delete the compute, it also deletes the uh, storage. Storage in the sense your data is lost. Okay, and thereby you are complete with a stop for billing both. Okay, so in case if you want the data to be retained, you will pause it, and whenever you want uh, to query, you will uh, start the dedicated SQL pool. Okay, that's how you can save uh, some billing cost. But now it is up and running. OK, it's a compute is running. It's a storage is running. OK, now let me go to the data and there you will see this name Chandra dedicated name of the database. Let me refresh it. See Chandra dedicated. You can see it as of now. There is no table there. One more point here you will note in serverless SQL pool, you know, there, are, there is no concept of table in serverless SQL pool. But in dedicated SQL pool, here you can see tables, external tables, external resources, views. So the point what I want to bring to your notice is what do you mean by table? So tables are managed ones, schema and data. Both are kept together. Data obviously is represented in column major format, but data and schema both are together. And here, you know, this data it is storing, okay, in the data lake store. So your data is going into the data lake store, okay, but your schema and data are being kept together. That, those are called as the managed tables. What about external tables? Schema and data are separate those are external tables now let us let me create a couple of tables here okay Now let us understand sharding uh, concept. Sharding concept means here we have seen data gets spreaded across multiple worker nodes. So here data gets divided into four uh, data sets. One data set goes into worker node one, second one goes to W2, third one goes to W3, and fourth one goes to W4. But there are different sharding patterns you know, which decide the policy how that data can be divided, how that data can be partitioned, how it decides which data to go to which node. Okay, so that is called as the sharding patterns. OK, or data partitioning or data distribution. Data distribution slash data partitioning. OK, so there are three main sharding patterns available here. Again, this is important point. And there may be uh, twisted questions on this topic. OK, so let me just uh, clearly and uh, detail explain you. So first of all, uh, there is something called as a. Uh, hash sharding. Hash sharding. This is fact, uh -huh. hash sharding. Hash sharding. Hash sharding takes a column on which it wants, we want to do partition. Okay, so accepts partitioning, partitioning column, accepts partitioning column. 
OK, how does it accept partitioning column? Just observe here. Here is a. One table. Okay, I am creating. And let me. Uh, create. From this database. New S SQL script, let me create. New SQL script, empty script. Initially, let me go with empty script. And here, observe, connected to dedicated SQL pool, and here a database name is also same. Okay, and just observe this create table query. I am asking it to create a table and give this name to the table. Okay, all these are the column names. Okay, and uh, thereafter, I want it to do distribution of the records. You know, as per hash policy. Now, what is this hash policy? That also I will tell. But here is one column name written: cells order number. Cells order number. Here is the. So on this, I want it to do partition. Okay. So what it is going to do is, you know, whenever this table is created, okay, as per the given column value, whenever we are inserting the record. You know where the first record to go? Should it go into the first partition, second, third, or fourth? So it will depend on the value of that column. What is that column? Cells order number. Depending on the value of that column, also uh, yes, it will insert that record or it will send that record either into first partition, second partition, third partition, or fourth partition. So column partition column, you have to choose the partition column. There are some of the rules of choosing the partition column. As of now, I just do not go. I do not want to go into it. OK, because uh, you know that will be deviation and uh, you know, those are you know, partitioning rules applicable to even databases and uh, other uh, services where partitioning uh, is a need. OK, so that's why uh, not directly related to Synapse Analytics, so I don't discuss it here. here. But yes, means we will choose ideal columns uh, as a partition column and data will uh, get distributed across multiple nodes. OK, so partition column to be selected to distribute the data uniformly. That is one of the rules of deciding the partition column. To distribute the data uniformly across all the worker nodes. OK, now here you try to understand one more thing. What kind of data or what kind of, uh, yes, what kind of data you will move uh, into uh, hash share, hash sharding? It's not sharing, it's sharding. So, data getting distributed, and that's why storage capacity. What is the storage capacity for the data? Storage capacity of worker node one plus storage capacity of worker node two plus storage capacity of worker node three and plus storage capacity of worker node 4. So it is offering you very large storage capacity. Large storage capacity and that's why, you know, very large data files to go there. Very large data files to go here. So which kind of files are very large? You know, normally you have two types of files. OK, one is a, 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 a file uh, having records for every event like sales event. You know, whenever any sales transaction happens, a record goes into that file. Such files are called as the fact files, FACT, fact, factual data. You know, factual data to go into such files, they are always very large. OK, that is one thing. And the second thing is, uh, so uh, fact, fact data, fact data go here. OK, now whenever there are large files, you need index to search for search for the data in the specific. So there what I do, I simply represent index for every. Yes. Index. OK, so for every data set, there is the index and this index obviously helps it to you know, get the data quickly very fast. Anyway, indexes uh, 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 indices in, uh, enhance the performance of data access. 
so indexes already are there so this file this file is indexable okay and see the syntax clustered column store index it means what it will be doing is this is a physical index physical this is not logical index so it is physical index it means you know your data goes in the order of data goes into the specific order physical order clustered column store index okay so because of this index data access becomes really fast in despite of you know very larger file size okay so distributedness i have mentioned there this is the way to mention that it is a hash uh, sharding here is a table name let me create this table now so it will create the table it has created the table and in the list of the tables let me refresh it in the list of the tables then this name has to uh, it has to show See, table has been created. Let us populate this table with some data. OK, and I want to bring the data for this from the NAT, say, from the internet. OK, so that select query also. Copy query, let me show to you. Here it is. Now see this query, copy command, copy into fact table, okay, and refer to this URL. This is a, 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 a this data set is available publicly on the net. Okay, there is one small correction I would have to do. Um, unwanted character we have received there. Okay, so this is a CSV file, and we are asking it to load the data from this CSV file into the table, the fact table. OK, so this query I'm running. So this query, what it will be, it will do. Now there are, you know, this query is not that much simple what it looks like. Not only it will bring the data from the internet, and that data it will be in the CSV format. It will have to convert that CSV. CSV is a row based format. Then it will have to convert that CSV data format into column format. And then it will have to upload that data into this table. Because here these tables are always uh, represented data in the column column major part. So I am putting this query to run, and then it will have to load uh, data to the state to stable. So it is going to take some time because you know this is being a fact table. Okay, it has loaded the data. Let me run the select query here to see whether it has really loaded the data uh, into the table. Select star from, and here is the table name. But whenever we have executed that copy command in the, here, this copy command, it has brought the data from that file from the internet. And that data has been stored into this table. So table is representing the schema. OK, this is a schema. So table is representing the schema and table is also having a data. So here is a data. So data has been populated into table. OK, and uh, that's how you know we will create a table uh, using this syntax. We will load the data into the table. We will we can you know, run the simple select query to uh, see the data. Okay. Now normally what happens is now let me explain to you quickly the star scheme. Star scheme. Okay. This is a data warehouse concept. Okay. So in star schema, what happens that your fact table is uh, here holding all transactional data. OK, miss data is uh, in data warehouse. It is not transactional, but normally this uh, uh, data comes through the transactions. OK, and then around it, there will be lookup tables. So this is one lookup table. This can be another lookup table. OK, and these the lookup tables are representing uh, dimension data. Lookup data. For example, if this transaction is a sales transaction, so 
what is the product list on which the sales has happened? So here maybe it is a list of the products. So product table becomes a dimension table here. Dimension. Dimension table. It can be product names. Here it can be product units. Product units. Here it can be date and time representing date and time. Date. It is representing date. Okay, here it is representing maybe customer list, customer names, customer names. Okay, so those are all lookup tables. And uh, in order to create a report, what you need, you need a data from the fact table, and also you need uh, data coming from these different lookup tables. So this dimension table may be representing product names with a production a product ID. But in the report, you don't need a product ID. You need product name against it. OK, so you have to create a joins. You have to create a joins. So this structure looks like. Uh, dimension. So this structure looks like a star, and that's why we call it as a stars. So couple of such dimension tables now let me create. OK. This is another dimension table. Let me create. OK, and for dimension table, you will note one thing that its distribution is not hash. Its distribution is a replicate. Now, what do you mean by replicate that also? I will explain to you. OK, its distribution is replicate. OK, see. Let me run this. The dimension table also got created. OK, and what is its name? It is, it is deemed reseller. It is deemed reseller. Let us populate it with its uh, uh, values coming from internet. So from public uh, data set, let me populate it. OK. Uh, team reset. So it will read data from the public data set and will populate that data into uh, deem reseller table. OK, so now I'm putting it to run. And see here. It will load the data into the table. It has populated it. Let me see whether it has really populated by running the select query. Select star from. So we are receiving the data here. But now let me explain you what do you mean by that replicate? OK, now in case of replicate, if you see that syntax, you will realize for that replicate, I am not mentioning any column name. So replicate means the data is not distributed. But replicate means what it really replicates. Whole table inside every worker node, whole table. So whole table, uh, this is reseller dimension table. Same will be replicated as it is into every worker. As this is dimension table, this is lookup table, their sizes are small. And that's why their replication does not cost me much. But with the replication, what happens is that the data, fact data existing in this worker node one can do join with the dimension data existing into the same worker node. Similarly, factor data existing in worker node 2 can establish a join you know, with a replicated table you know, uh, of the dimension. So joins work fast here. OK, and every data will be replicated into multiple tables and that we can afford for the purpose, uh, purpose that uh, you know, these uh, tables are normally small in size. So somewhere I mentioned back table. It here. Huh. Very large data points. OK, replicate sharding. So 
रेप्लीकेट जा रही है डेटा रिप्लीकेटेड एक्रॉस ऑल वर्कर नोट डेटा रिप्लीकेटेड एक्रॉस ऑल वर्कर डेटा रिप्लीकेटेड एक्रॉस ऑल वर्कर नोट ओके नॉर्मली डायमिशन टेबल्स आर स्मॉल इन साइज और स्मॉल साइज टेबल्स लाइक डायमेंशन टेबल्स ओके दे आर ऑल्सो इंडेक्सड you know so on with inside every worker node it also creates index so they are indexed okay because of you know their performance join performance also increases okay and fact tables create joins on dimension tables dimension tables and this join you know works with high performance it it works with a very high performance so this combination of fact table going uh, in the hash sharding and uh, dimension table going into uh, replicate sharding you know this combination gives you best performance and why we call it as a star schema because uh, dimension table around a fact table they create you know a view like a star and that's why we call them as a star schema okay so whenever we create such multiple dimension tables around uh, the fact table no? there after then a join query join select query can be executed so here is the join select i cannot run this query as of now because i haven't created all the uh, dimension tables here okay but if you see this join query okay uh, see this join See this join in this. You know, I am creating a join on the fact table into dimension reseller, dimension geography, dimension product. Okay, so on three tables we are creating a join CO, and thereby, you know, uh, this join query can bring uh, the columns from multiple tables can generate a report. You know. of the columns coming from multiple tables so that's all about the star schema that's all about the hash sharding and replicate sharding now let me discuss about uh say snowflake scheme snowflake scheme snowflake in snowflake schema what happens you know it will be similar to star schema let me uh copy this let me paste it here okay but in star schema you know this dimension tables are not normalized so there may be duplication or replication of the data across dimension tables so in case of first normal form second normal form you know the stars you get a star schema after you apply first and second normal form okay first and second normal form you don't apply third normal form for transitive dependence okay but if you apply third normal form here then you get then you get snowflake schema so this dimension table may be you know uh, joined with some another dimension table this dimension table may be joined to this dimension table so you get a complex structure here so whenever you are getting a complex structure you know and a complete means implementation of all three normal forms okay all or more more than two normal forms okay apply more than two normal forms okay for getting snowflake structure so snowflake structure you know whenever you are applying a normal form obviously 
thereby you are reducing the data redundancy minimal data redundancy data redundancy that is one benefit so maximum data consistency because consistency and redundancy they are inversely proportional maximum data consistency that is another benefit here but with what cost now the let, let me mention the cost because these are benefits it is leading to complex structure complex structure of joints and as there are multi, many joints you know performance of the query also goes down because of many joints performance of queries go down but these are very important things okay because maximum data consistency you know that is a basic reason why we apply normalization okay to achieve minimum data redundancy and maximum data consistency so in case if you need a maximum data consistency in some scenario then you have to go with a snowflake schema but if you are managing your data consistency by taking extra effort but you are bothering about the performance of the queries then you can go with a star schema so in case of star schema you know data consistency is at question data consistency is at question that is the first thing the second thing uh, here is data consistency is at question the second thing is uh, uh, simple queries and high performance simple queries and high performance so that is the trade off between these two uh, schemas and uh, you know looking at your requirement looking at the system you know you have to choose one of them in case if you feel like uh, in your system you cannot take extra effort to manage a uh, data consistency then you know, going with a snowflake schema is your need because you cannot maintain data consistent consistency by taking extra efforts and you want that schema itself to take care of the data consistency there then you have to go with a snowflake scheme or other way you can go with a star scheme there is a third type of sharding okay that also let me mention uh, here how do we create the tables that I'll, i already have explained to you okay how do you create a fact table how do you create a uh, dimension table that i already have discussed with you there is a third type of sharding and that sharding is called as a round robin sharding round robin sharding no round robin sharding you know for fact table you know you are going to use hash sharding for dimension table you know you are going to use the replicate sharding for what purpose is round robin sharding is this is actually a staging sharding to upload data to fact tables a staging sharding to upload data to upload the data to uh, hash sharding remember you are using uh, hash sharding for storing fact data and fact data is always of the very high Uh, sites uploading of this such a data from one uh, location to another location is always going to be a time consuming so in that case then you know so here it is here it is so whenever you are uploading this data you know what it has to do is it has to take an extra measure here to decide to which partition the data to go okay so partitioning policy partitioning policy so for example whenever you want to insert a first record 
on the first record on the partitioning column, it will have to apply, uh, you know, hash function to identify to which worker node uh, that record to go. You know, in case if you are aware of, uh, uh, you know, hash uh, data structure where there are buckets and uh, whenever you are inserting a record, it has to decide to which bucket the record to go by applying uh, hash function. A similar kind of concept is here. Whenever first record has to go, it will apply the hash function to decide whether that record will go into first partition, second, third, or fourth. This hash function, okay, takes a longer time, and that's why inserting of records into uh, hash sharding always take a longer time because hash function, uh, you know, comes into play. In case if you are loading your data from on premise, then internet speed may make your uploading of the data slow. Once that data goes to the cloud, you know, then uh, hash function takes its own time to decide to which cluster the data to go. Okay. So in that case, then what you normally do that you upload the data to round robin. Upload data to round robin. So you upload data to hash tables in two stages. In first stage, okay, data source to round robin. Data source to round robin. Data source round robin. Data source to round robin. That is the first step. And the second step is from round robin to hash table. Round robin. Hash. That is the second step. Though here we are following a second uh, two steps and we are migrating data in two steps, but this process is always fast. This process is always fast. In round robin, what it does is it does not apply hash function. And it moves the data in order. Like first record, whatever it be, will go to the first worker. Second record will go to the second worker node. Third will go to the third worker node. Fourth will go to the fourth worker node. Fifth will go to the first worker node again. And that's why we call it the round robin. So data goes in the round robin fashion without applying a hash function over there. Because of this, you know, with the full throttle of internet, data goes into the cloud. And once data goes into the cloud, within the cloud from one arrangement to another arrangement, whenever you are moving data, you know, that data moment happens really fast. This data moment happens really fast. Okay, so in order to load the data to hash table, you have to do it in two steps. The first step moves your data into round robin tables and from round robin table, then you move data to the hash. And once this data is moved to the hash, there is no need of round robin table. You can drop it. Okay, and your data will go into the hash. There is a role for round robin sharding. So here I have explained all types of shardings to you. Here I have explained two types of schemas also. And here I did show to you how can we create hash table? <coughs> how can we create dimension table? And how can we create a joint query on hash table and dimension table? So that thing also I explained to you. In case if you have any question on this, please go ahead. So put your questions on dedicated SQL pool. Hello. Anybody has any question on dedicated SQL? Please let me know.
Uh, okay. Uh, yes, Sai Kumar. Is it possible for you to post the question right away? Here I have shown to you how can we create a dedicated SQL pool? How can we create a database? And on the data database, how can we create uh, hash tables or star schema? What do you mean by snowflake schema? What do you mean by Fact tables and what do you mean by dimension tables? So all these things I explained. Is sharding? No, no. Sharding is very common concept. Sharding is very common concept. Sharding basically is to partition the data. So different partitioning patterns, they are called as a sharding. There are three types of shardings. Synapse has adopted hash sharding. Can we directly use without sharding? Yes, yes. We can directly use without sharding, but why I am talking about sharding, that is again a point to note. This Dedicated SQL pool is a data warehouse. You know, uh, whenever you have very large data to process, there you will prefer going with a dedicated SQL. Very large data to process. Whenever you have complex system of the data, you know, there you will prefer going with a uh, and very large data size, there you will go with this one. So in case if you create a table without a sharding, then that table will not be distributed. The, uh, there will be limitations on size of the table. Because that table as it is not distributed, that table has to be created within one node only. And how much data that table can accommodate depends on the size of the storage for that node. Size of the storage of that node. And that's, that limitation is always a small. Okay, so here you can obviously create a small tables. Okay, but there does not lie the that such type of table you can create in database also. Why do you need synapse for that? But power of the synapse lies in you know, having a very large distributed tables, okay, and distributed compute. And that's why only that point I brought to you. So I agree that it can, uh, you know, have a normal tables, but that is not its power. Uh, star schema, can it be shared? No, I cannot share that block. Huh. Uh, block diagram I will share with you, but that uh, lab file I can't share with you. It is uh, bound to uh, copyright. What does hash sharding means compared to other sharding? Hash sharding is for very large files. And it can accommodate very large data because it does not hold data into one worker. It distributes data across multiple worker nodes. Maximum size of this work the cluster is 60, 60. Now I got I I, I missed that number, but uh, maximum number of you know worker nodes here can be 60. So maximum partitions can be 60. So, uh, storage capacity of 60 worker nodes will be a storage capacity for your table, hash table. You know, and that is very large storage capacity. So, hash sharding has very large storage capacity. It can uh, make a distributed processing possible. That is another benefit. 
it can uh, you know have ind indexes that's why you know it gives me great performance also and it encourages parallel processing it encourages parallel processing and that's why you know uh, it's a performance further more increases that's all about hash sharding how data distributed from round robin sharding to hash sharding okay there internally it uses uh, hash function here it uses hash function but data already is existing on the cloud and you are simply moving uh, data in the cloud from one location to the another location there then you know that migration happens with a lightning speed okay so though there is a hash function but that data transfer happens with a lightning speed because all of the data is existing uh, into synapse so this step you know applies a, a hash function but that data transfer happens with a lightning speed because whole data is already in the synapse how data distributed from round when that i explained goes on does on prem sql server undergo any kind of sharding yes it may be supporting sharding on prem sql server okay the uh, that also may be supporting sharding because that supports the data warehousing you will have to enable data warehousing there and it supports the sharding it also can support the sharding <clears throat> so yes to uh, that question so we see hash function in action so we see like how it does it no no sai kumar it is not clear to me how hash function you mean how hash function works is that your question how hash function works is that your question ah huh. okay so i am coming back to this diagram now here consider there are four nodes worker node 1 worker node 2 worker node 3 worker node 4 and uh, the uh, partition column that we are selecting here is a region there are 10th regions there are 10th regions let me mention here region 1 to 10 okay now whenever it receive the first record consider this first record Uh, has a value say three. Okay, so whenever it has a value three, it will go into W three. So what kind of hash function it might be applying? So region, let me represent region by R percentage. It means calculate the remainder by dividing it by four. What is four? Four is maximum number of partitions. So whenever you are dividing that value, region value. With the four and finding out the remainder, you know here you will get a remainder because the value is less than three. That's why it will go into uh, third partition. So calculating the remainder of the division of uh, partition column value with a maximum number of partitions that is one of the hash function. One of the hash. There are a number of examples of such hash functions. Okay, I am just discussing very simple hash function here. Okay, in reality, these hash functions may be complex also. You know where uh, they may be taking a longer time for the execution. Next record, what we receive has a region six. Okay, so it will be divided by four, and remainder will be uh, whenever it is divided by four, division will be one, and remainder will be two. So it will go into W. so whenever 6 is divided by uh, four and if we get a remainder then the remainder will be two the third record what we receive here has a region say 9 so again what it will do that 9 will be divided by four and remainder will be one when you divide 9 by four division will be 2 but remainder will be 1 so 
it means the record has to go into the first partition. So that is one, you know, simple idea I am giving to you how hash function works. So this is very simple hash function, what I want to discuss. How hash and schema related to each other? No, no, I am still not getting this question. And the hash is a, uh, you know, way to apply a function on a single column value to identify uh, the partition number. That is hash. And what is schema? Schema is a you know, physical structure of the columns, their sizes, their types. That is called as the schema. They are entirely different. When you are asking me how they are related to each other, one only thing what I can say is that the hash column you know, comes is one of the columns of the schema, but that is the only relation. We need to optimize both for performance. What do you mean by optimization of schema? Why do we need to optimize schema? No, I, I haven't got this question. Oh, acha acha. Okay, okay. Star or snowflake schema you are talking. Mm, ah, yes, yes. We have to op optimize them for performance. So there is a you know trade off. Like star schema, uh, you go with the star schema for for the simplicity and performance at the cost of what data consistency. So there you lost data consistency. In Snowflake, it is always the complex, and that's why it is it always go with a degraded performance with what benefit. That it gives you 100% consistency. So that is the trade off. Whether you need less consistency and high performance, or whether you need a high consistency and less performance, that is the trade off. What you can do is you can uh, go with, uh, say, star schema, okay, with add on consistency measures there you will get better performance also and you will get you know uh, you will address the, uh, the concern of the consistency there <laughs> have i answered your question sai kumar <laughs> huh. okay so I think it is a time for us to go for the next topic. Okay, and the next topic, what I want to go with is Spark. Okay, so we will uh, understand more on the Spark now. Okay, and uh, how do we get the data? How we, you know, apply analytics over the data? How we can clean the data? You know, all those things I would like to uh, show to you. Okay, so for that purpose, what I do. How is it? publishing is done? System. Give me a minute. Dedicated SQL pool is already charging me. Now it is the time for me to shut it down. 
and uh, stop it from charging. OK, so here. I go to manage section and this dedicated SQL tool. Let me pause it for a while. So hereby I am pausing it. And what next tool do I create here is a Spark tool. Here it is. I want to create a Spark tool. Again, remember, uh, it is a, unlike a serverless SQL tool where it does not get automatically created, but I have to create it explicitly. I'm clicking on plus new. OK, and here it is asking me name of the spark tool. So maybe some name I'm giving. Okay. Now spark needs very large memory because you know spark works on big data. Spark works on very large data size. And what is the significance of Spark? That so large data site is manages in RAM, RAM memories of every machine. As it manages so large data in RAM memory of the machine, you know you need a uh, memory optimized machine because for Spark such memory optimized machine gives the best performance. And that is one thing. And the second thing is. As it manages whole data, keeping it into, into the RAM, you know, it's a processing speed is a turbo speed. OK, if you compare it with a Hadoop. You know, way of processing of Hadoop and Spark, one and the same with one major difference. That Hadoop. Uh, interacts with the disk so rigorously. To you know, uh, work with the data. Hadoop does not use RAM to store the data. Hadoop uses disk to store the data. And Spark uses RAM to store the data. So in case if to the Spark, if you give memory optimized machine, in case if uh, to the Spark you give, you know, memory rich machines, you know, Spark gives you turbo speed of processing. So memory optimized. I give minimum uh, node size to keep uh, you know, it's a cost uh, lowest. Number of uh, nodes, I go with a minimum. Only three nodes. Only three nodes. OK, how Spark works? Exactly in the same way how your massive parallel process is working. Control node. Now in case of Spark, you call it a master. And so that is one node and then I am going with the two worker nodes. That's why total count is three. That's why total count is three. Here I'm giving three. So one master node and two. Worker nodes. Master node will receive the command. And worker nodes will execute that command. Same command on both the worker nodes, but on the different data set. On the different data sets. OK, so architecture of massive parallel processing or you know way of execution of massive parallel process and way of execution of Hadoop or Spark. You know they are one very similar. OK, so master node receive the command. Submit those commands to both the worker nodes, but both the worker nodes run the same set of commands, but on the different data sets. Yes. Cost per hour. Dynamic allocate executors. No. OK, any additional sitting? No. Number of ideal minutes. Idle minutes. Let me change it to maybe 30. OK, and then Spark version and other things are there. Uh, you know, I don't change it. I don't change anything here and I am submitting it for the creation of the Spark. So it is going to create three nodes there. And then on those three nodes, I will run the commands. <laughs> so it will take uh, some time to provision it, and thereafter, then we can run the commands. So in the meantime, let me take you to some of the commands.
Okay, so Sparkpool is ready. Sparkpool is uh, successfully deployed. I am going to do uh, the create a notebook now. So these uh, SQL script I am closing, and we don't need them now. Okay, hereby I am asking it to create a notebook. Okay, so I can ask it to create a notebook, and here it has created a notebook. OK, so notebook is actually a kind of an editor where I can submit uh, PySpark commands. It is just an editor. Who will run my command? So the Spark, my commands, Spark commands will be executed on the Spark pool that we have created here in the Spark pool. OK, and I will go with the PySpark language. What are all languages available on Spark? So you can see Scala language, PySpark language, the Spark SQL, Spark R. The earlier they uh, did provide us a support of C sharp. Now they have withdrawn that support. OK, but you know one Spark engine uh, can run a code written in multiple languages. Code written in multiple languages. Within the same notebook, first command can be written in PySpark. Second command can be written in Scala. Third command can be written in Spark SQL and fourth command can be written in Spark R within the same node. That is very interesting. OK, but out of these four languages, which language I want to keep as a default? OK, so there I am selecting Python. So this will be a default language. Because whenever I mention in a Scala code, no, I have to you know, give something called as a magic prompt to run the Scala. How to give that mag magic prompt that also I will tell you. OK, but I want to go with the PySpark to be a default language. Now here when th this is whole PySpark code. OK, blog account name. So Chandra DP203 store. That's Chandra DP203 store. Let me just verify. Chandra DP203 store. Ah, yes, there is a data container. Inside a data container, there is a loan data raw.csv. That file I already have uploaded. So path is correct. Now I have to create a SAS token here uh, to access that file. OK, so I go to the storage. And here I come out of the data container. Okay, and I ask it to create a SAS token. Here is SAS token, shared access signature. So I want to create it. I am giving full rights here because I do not want to go into uh, you know details of uh, which option to be given uh, or what uh, checkbox to check here at what point of time. Now that will be out of context of today's discussion. OK, so I select this one. I select uh, for a key, key one, and I ask it to generate a SAS token. It has generated a SAS token. Here is a SAS token that I copy to clipboard and I mention that SAS token here in these double quotes. So SAS token seems to be a very large uh, string. It is a large string and it decides uh, level of the access to the uh, storage account. So through this SAS token, I am giving a full access, but otherwise I can restrict access. OK, uh, variables are getting declared and let, now let me put it to run. OK, here you observe. Means, uh, all these are the steps. You know, we are configuring storage for. Accessing uh, data from the storage. App. All these are the steps, you know, of PySpark. You now of accessing the data from the storage account. Here I am asking it. To read the data. Given at this path. WSBS path. OK, here it is. WSBS path. Yes, container name given, blog account name given, and blog relative path is given. So here I am giving all the details, OK, to let it reach to the uh, specific file path, specific file name. OK, uh, delimiter. Whenever I'm mentioning comma as a delimiter, thereby I am asking it to mention CSV file, comma separated value. CSV means comma separated values. Okay. And in that comma separated value file, 
you know, if I take you to that file, uh, you know, that file has a very first record as a column names. See, here is the file. See, very first record also already has a column names. Huh. Okay, so with that, now let me go. And uh, that's why here I am mentioning header is equal to true to suggest to it that to uh, get the column names from the very first record. I am putting it to run. Run all. Okay, but let me say, see the settings once. Three nodes, two executors. Yes. There are two executors and one master node. Patient timeout. Okay, I would like to go with this configuration and let me put it to run now. And uh, let us see the data frame, what it will create. Now it is going to take a longer time. Okay, because uh, you know it has to provision the cluster of three nodes. Okay, and uh, second thing, uh, thereafter it will create. Spark session, so I believe many of you are from the Spark uh, awareness. You know, so it has to create a Spark session. Okay, and that's why it will take a little longer time. In the meantime, let me mention another command. Okay, display DF. This DF is called as a data plane. Okay, and what is its purpose? That also I will explain to you. Okay. Spark is very easy to work with. So you may see some complex code here, but whenever you will try to understand it, you will realize it is very precise and very easy to work. Here I have mentioned multiple lines because uh, I am trying to make the these uh, codes a bit generic. Okay, and uh, there we are configuring uh, storage account, and that's why here we are declaring the variables for the storage account, and then here we are. You know, actually configuring configuring the storage account. You know, this is actual a Spark code, which is you know reading the data from the storage account and converting the data into Spark data frame. Meantime, let me publish uh, this code. So let it complete its execution. I believe it will take next one or two minutes. Complete the execution. In the meantime, let me check whether I have received any question. Multi-threading concept applies to Spark then? Uh, no, uh, yes, multi-threading is there, but uh, uh, you know, uh, here, if you see this diagram, I'm not talking about multi-threading. Worker node one is one virtual machine. This is another virtual machine. This is one more virtual machine, and this is one more virtual machine. So there are different virtual machines on which you know your data is getting processed. When multi-threading comes into play, when you have single machine and inside that single machine, there are multiple CPUs. There then your multi-threading gives benefit to it, uh, benefit. But here I am not talking about CPUs of the machine. I am talking about multiple machines. So the concept is beyond multi-threading. Every machine may have CPUs. Every machine may be running threads internally. But I am going beyond that and I am going outside the machine and having multiple such machines. 
there comes the distributed process. So what I am talking about is, uh, you know, above and beyond multi-threading. Hadoop also uses multiple machines. Yes. So when I try to compare Hadoop and Spark, I told you one difference that their way of distributed processing is same. But where is the difference? Hadoop uses disk storage very rigorous. And that's why you know, it runs slow. What Spark does? Spark accommodates whole data into RAM. And that's why, you know, reading the data from the RAM and writing the data to the RAM, you know, works 100 times faster than, you know, interacting with the disk. And that's why Spark is around 100 times faster. But their distributed processing is same. You know, Spark runs at the top of Hadoop. Spark runs at the top of Hadoop, but do not push data to disk or do not pull data from the disk. It runs at the top of Hadoop. It harnesses distributed processing compute, MR. MR uh, compute of the Hadoop, okay, but keeps the data in the RAM. Hadoop has a risk of failure. Then if it is rigorous with the disk, no, you see Hadoop, Hadoop has a different, uh, say what we will say, a uh, fault tolerant uh, policies. So maybe in case if one, uh, the disk of one machine goes down, you know, it creates a replica uh, into uh, disk of other machines. So Hadoop has, you know, its own special fault tolerant system. And uh, thereby it creates a three replica of every data set. Okay, here, it has to deal judiciously with the RAM. You know, anyway, RAM is always very precious. Further, here, uh, Spark is uh, storing big data to the RAM. So, Spark cannot afford having a you know, replica of the data. Although Spark has a provision to replicate the data, but ideally, Spark cannot afford to replicate the data. And that's why Spark has another uh, mechanism. We call it the resilience. Why would anyone choose Hadoop over Spark? Ah, okay, I was talking about resilience. So again, here, because of paucity of the time, I cannot explain and I cannot discuss resiliency. Okay, but without having the replication of the data, still, Spark is, you know, fault tolerant. Still, if one node goes down, you know, Spark still continues working. So it has its own fault tolerant, uh, you know, architecture. So even if Spark is not using disk and even if Spark is working with a RAM, there are you know, possibilities that uh, RAM may lose the data. There are possibilities that you know, whole node goes down. Okay, but still Spark has its own way to deal with such a situations and Spark is very powerful in fault tolerance also. Why would anyone choose a Hadoop over Spark? Now, that is a very big question. And what I know as on today is only you know, legacy applications are running on the Hadoop. Otherwise, new applications are preparing going with a Spark only. Only legacy applications are running on the Hadoop. Okay, this code got executed after three and a half uh, minutes. Now let me show you the data. And here you will see. I put it to run. Yes. This command is not ready. Here. Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. Why this error it is? Line magic function percentage not found.
think about it, don't see. Why it is not running his command? It is correct. Uh, just a minute. I think uh, problem is not with a magic prompt. Problem is with one of the commands. I think uh, this is a being a Python in a margin somewhere. I am I'm missing a margin. Just a minute. Let me define those commands correctly. No. Now it will work. Yes, it is working. So. Commands were not properly tabbed. That's why. Yes. And now let me declare. Define. Sorry. Display. Yes. And here is the data that you use. You have received the data. And this whole data you know, is existing in the RAM, RAM of the machine. And then on this data, you can apply different and different operations. Now, this is a loan amount uh, data. You can apply different operations over the data. So, If you want to see table structure, you know, print schema is a method available there. So for that, you will have to learn you know, Spark API. Okay, so df dot print schema. Okay, here you will come to know what column it has identified for, you know, uh, what all columns it has identified there. And there you will realize that column names it has taken properly. But column types, you know, it hasn't taken properly. So in order to ask it to take column types properly, you know, here in this, uh, you can uh, mention uh, different uh, uh, configurations. So for example, dot option infer schema, infer schema. Okay, and a value to mention here is true. So infer schema means thereby you are asking it to identify column types of its own. You are asking it to identify column types of its own. Then I am putting it to run. True, T capital, I think. Yes, I am putting it to run. <clears throat> OK, and when I display it. It will have to it will show me the data. OK, when then I will see the schema. Now see how what difference that infer schema has made that now it has identified the types of the columns from the data. So it went through. First 200, 300 records and, and identified the type of the every column. So multiple such type of you know parameters are available there. Like you can ask it to collect the header, you can ask it to identify the delimiter, you can ask it to infer the schema. Multiple such parameters are there, and thereby you have got the data frame created. If you want to see central tendency of the data frame, here is a a command to do that. Uh, let me do one thing. Let me create one short, small data frame out of it using this command. 
there may be 15 columns in that data frame. I just do not want to go with all 15 columns. From there, I want to create a new data frame having only three columns. So here it is. OK, so this data frame will have only three columns. Let me show uh, uh, this uh, data frame. So it has only three columns here. And on this data frame, now if I want to apply uh, central tendency, df1 dot describe. Describe. So it will show me central tendency of every uh, column value there. Just a minute. I will have to use a display here. Because that describe command returns a new data frame, which I would like to see. Here it is. So count. Total 613 records are there. You know, for applicants income, this is an average. Mean means average. This is standard deviation. This is the smallest value. So complete central tendency, what it is showing to me. So multiple such commands are there. Okay, and with these commands, uh, uh, you can work with the data bricks and notebooks. Okay, I'm taking you through this document to you know, bring a couple of more commands to your notice. Select gender. Okay, what it will do, it will uh, come up with uh, all distinct values of the gender column. So gender is a column there. So here it is. Gender is a column. See, gender is a column in data frame. You know? So I, what are all you know, valid values of that column? Let me just select or let me just see. So only two are the valid values there, zero and one. If you want to drop duplicate, there is a command. If you want to fill missing values, there is a command. You know, so in Spark, there are commands for all these. If you want to see the records uh, meeting only given condition, there is a command. If you want to do some uh, uh, you know, schema change, like you want to add these two columns to get a new column, there is a command. If you want to change the type of a column, if you want to rename the column, you know, so in, in, in the terminology of the database, DDL operations, not DDL uh, operations. Ah, yes, DDL operations, DML operations, select queries, all are possible here. Going beyond that, and I can finally, I can save data to the uh, storage account. So whatever be the, you know, uh, ETL operation, data transformation operation, here we have done on the data frame, using uh, notebook, you know, finally, if you want to store that data to the disk, that is also possible. Not only that, but here we can ask it to create tables from the data frames, tables from the data. And these tables, you know, we can join together. So there is the inner join available, there is the outer join available, left outer, right outer, full join, all those joins are also available. The point what I, I want to bring to your notice is that here data exists in RAM. That data you can view as a table and on multiple such tables you can create joins and reports. On this data you can do analytics using Spark API. On this data you can use machine learning also because Spark has its own set of algorithms to do machine learning. So regression algorithms you can apply, classification algorithms you can apply, clustering you can do. So the machine learning is also possible. So data bricks or notebook. You know what you are explaining here is is applicable to data bricks also. Because I doubt whether we will get time to visit the data bricks now. Okay, but whatever I am talking about is applicable to data bricks also. So here we can use this Spark engine or data bricks for ETL operations for extracting data from different data sources, you know, managing that data, uh, managing that data, wrangling that data in the RAM. OK, and finally, you know, uh, aggregating the data. So group by also is applicable here. So we can 
create aggregated data so we can consolidate the data um, so lots of operations and almost all operations what we normally apply on database tables you know, here we can do okay from where uh, where you will realize the uh, data that you are receiving is from csv file and still most of the rdbm uh, rdbms operations you can apply here and thereby you can process the uh, data and final version of the data you can push to the disk okay and then that data you can use to draw different visuals that data you can use to draw different so here you can use a spark to do big data analytics you can use a spark to perform machine learning also and very very powerful any question on spark please go ahead Spark commands and pandas are same? No, they are not same. There are variations. The major variation is regarding the data frame. Uh, pandas data frame is not distributed. Spark data frame is distributed. What is similarity in these two data frames? Both these data frames are column major, but pandas data frame is not distributed. Spark data frame is it. So Pandas data frame can give you performance. You know, if data size is small, but whenever your data size is of the big data size, you know, then you know you cannot go with the Pandas, you will have to go with the Spark. Okay, and in API also, there are differences. There are some, uh, so there may be some same commands, but there are many commands which are, you know, different. There are differences. And one of the major differences in Spark is, you know, in order to optimize operations, there is a, something called as a partitioning. How many partitions do you want to use to run that command? How many worker nodes you want to use to run that command? That you can define. You know, uh, that happens for the distributed system only. Panda does not have such a power. Is Impala process also we use like Spark? What I know is uh, I don't know much about Impala, uh, but what I know is the Spark processing is faster than Impala. Somewhere uh, long back, you know, I had compared Impala uh, with a Spark, and there, uh, you know, the the effort was to show that Spark is faster than Impala also. So exactly uh, where is the architectural difference that I don't know, but as of now what I can see is Spark is becoming more popular because of its architecture and because of its performance. Okay, I think it is the time for us to take one 10 minutes uh, break and post break what and all we need to integrate Spark in any project. Uh, that question, Harisha, that question is not clear. What and all we need to integrate Spark in any project? No, no, that question is not clear to me. Okay, you please uh, uh, describe it further so that. I can answer. I mean, how to integrate Spark? Apache is based on Hadoop MapReduce. Apache Spark is based on Hadoop MapReduce. What does that mean? Apache Spark you know, can run on Yarn. Yarn is you know, Hadoop 2. It can run on Mesos. It can run standalone, so even on different platforms. Apache Spark can run. So it can run on Hadoop also. So whenever it is running on the Hadoop, 
you know it does not it does not work as a map reduce no it simply harnesses distributed compute power of the hadoop uh, yes that distributed compute power is called as the map reduce in case of hadoop so yes so that that map reduce uh, distributed compute what uh, spark harnesses so that is correct Apache Spark is a lightning fast cluster computing technology designed for fast computation. It is based on Hadoop MapReduce and it extends MapReduce. Ah, uh, yes, but with one difference. Hadoop MapReduce uses uh, disk very rigorously. And Spark works like Hadoop MapReduce only with one difference that it tries to do most of its operations in the RAM. So architecture of Apache Spark and Hadoop say distributed processing. Apache Spark can run at the top of Hadoop. But what Apache Spark refrain itself from doing is that Apache Spark refrains itself from interacting with the disk and tries to manage all the things into RAM. So architecture is same. Compute is same and that compute is being called as a map reduce with the one difference that Spark, Spark has a concept of data frame where this data frame is capable of you know uh, dealing with a very large data keeping whole data into RAM. That's what its meaning is. Have I explained it? So I think it is the time for us to take a uh, tea break and we will resume our session. Uh, so tea break. We will resume our session by 4.32. Let's resume session by 4.32. Okay. And a post uh, tea break, we will, uh, I will quickly explain you about, uh, you know, Synapse pipeline. And thereafter, we will go for you know, some of the sample questions. I'm going on mute.
OK, I'm back. <clears throat> I am sharing my screen, but before that, just hello. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. uh, is it possible if I call you after six o'clock? So I'm sharing my screen. And would like to know when your screen uh, reaches there. This is one URL. Let me share with you. And in this URL, you will see multiple labs uh, given for practice. So those labs also you can follow. OK, here is a, in a link to the labs. OK, step by step. Uh, you know, labs are given here, so I try to cover some of the labs uh, from this long list. Uh, but there are what I remember is there are around 26 labs here. OK, and these labs, if you uh, practice all these labs, you know, these labs will give you real a good insight of uh, how you uh, perform implementation. OK, it will give good practice also. Yes. So that link you please follow and uh, uh, ensure that before you go for the examination as a part of practice of uh, uh, study of examination, you, know, you will complete these labs. Also. Now one more thing I would like to bring to you. OK, that will be the you know, uh, previous last thing. And thereafter, then we will go for having a look at some of the sample questions. OK, so here I want to. To create one simple pipeline okay using synapse so how do we create that pipeline that thing i want to bring to your notice okay but before i bring that point to your notice let me upload one of the files there just uh, first of all now i don't need a spark so let me shut down the spark engine because otherwise it will keep uh, charging me so it doesn't allow me to delete just a minute huh? there is a some problem here okay i will have to delete a notebook to delete the uh, engine okay so here first of all let me delete the notebook okay. and now let me go to delete the park engine <laughs> Once it is deleted, now it will stop charging me. OK, and in the meantime, then now it will be deleted. Here it will. It is deleting. Let me just remove all other not notifications. Yes, it is deleting. And I hope within next one minute, you know, it will delete it. OK, why it has failed? Failed to delete. I will have to delete it, otherwise it will keep charging me. So. Now there is no reason why it should. It should not be deleted. Delete. 
or I will have to try after some time to delete it. But it is essential for me to delete as otherwise it will keep charging me. Good minute. Let me mention here five, and after it goes into pause, then let me try whether I can delete it. Enable number of minutes idle. Uh, okay. So after five minutes, oh, it is not allowing me to do anything. So if it is not allowing me to do anything, you know, anyway, I will have to bear some cost on it. Okay, that's an issue. So what if you directly pause it from the three dots menu? Sorry. You can directly pause it from the three dots menu and then delete it. There is no pause, pause option settings. here. Pause pause settings, settings what does it do? It allows me to change this value. All right. Okay, but uh, it is not allowing you to change that value also. So maybe after 30 minutes, automatically it will go into the pause. And thereafter, I may try to delete it. But now it is not allowing you to choose and apply new value. Okay, that is also it is failing. So there may be some bug here you know, that is causing me the problem. Okay, let me try to do it. Whether I can do it from here, let me just try doing it from here. I used to delete a notebook to you know delete the Spark pool, but this time you know that is also not working. Uh, just a minute. Chandra dedicated that also I want to delete Chandra Spark pool. These two entries I want to delete Chandra Spark and Chandra dedicated. So let me just try deleting it from here. Delete. I hope it has to work now. One succeeded, one fail. Do document cannot be deleted since it is referenced by notebook one. That is surprising. I already have deleted notebook one. Now there is no notebook associated with it. No notebook associated with it. And I did publish also. Oh. Oh. Let me delete. I tried to delete it and I was in impression that it has been deleted. OK, let me publish it. OK, now it will be deleted. Publishing done. Now let me delete. So you may also face similar problem though. So please uh, 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 watch you know, so how I am trying to delete it. OK, this uh, will be this bug they will remove soon. But as of now, 
you know you cannot uh, leave your spark pool without deletion so you will have to follow these steps now it has been deleted uh, okay uh, so i am going to the synapse analytics and there uh, you know one more uh, sorry i go to the storage and i want to upload one of the files here into the storage i am uploading one more file and on that one more file you know i will show you how to create one simple data flow okay so here in the data let me upload one more file movies.db movies.db csv let me upload that file okay and i am clicking on upload and that file will be uploaded here okay it's not a big file has been uploaded quickly okay using this file i will uh, create one uh, data transformation uh, pipeline. OK, let me show you the content of that file. So you will come to know what are all columns there. Movie title. Genre, John, genre, year, rating and some other columns. OK, so those are the columns out of these. You know, here you will see this is a movie ID. This is a title, perhaps. Uh, this is a, you know, a genre of the uh, uh, movie. This is an year. OK, this is the rating and this is a rotten tomato, some column. OK, so out of these, you can see here is a numeric key, a numeric value. And here is the numeric value and rating also is the numeric value. OK. Uh, rating here it is here here it is a here it is a year and here it is a rating so both these are numeric values okay but now this is csv file so whenever you will see a uh, file getting uploaded and uh, whenever you receive this file uh, in uh, pipeline you will see that file has all text data i am i i want to create one uh, you know uh, data pipeline here. For that purpose, first of all, I will have to create a link service to connect to the data storage. So here, first of all, I will create a link service to connect to the data storage. OK, then I will create a data set. OK, so here link service, link service to connect to the data storage. This is a link service DP203 store. I think I already have created a link service. Let me just check. Is this a link service? Chandra DP203 store. Yes, I don't remember when I did create it, okay, but yes, it is existing. Let me just. There's the connection. OK, and uh, Chandra DP203 store there, that movie file I already have uploaded. OK, so it seems this link service is already there. I can use that link service. Now, in order to read the data, I have to create one data set. And in order to write it, I have to create another data set. So I can create these data sets here. OK, in the. SQL data set integration data set that I will have to create. Now try to understand the difference in between link service and the data set. Link service represents, uh, you know, authentication information needed to connect to the storage data source. What data set represents? Data set represents actual file from where you are needing the data. You are reading the data, actual file. So integration data set here I am selecting. 
I want to read the data from the block storage. So I'm mentioning here as a block storage. Here it is. OK, link service will connect to the data store. And data set will now. Uh, represent the data. So I'm clicking on continue. Now this is the CSV file movie DB dot CSV. This is CSV file, so I will have to select the data format here this way. Now this is, you know, UI tool. We did these things through the command in uh, uh, serverless SQL tool and in dedicated SQL. But this is UI tool. You know, here you do these things without giving a clue. OK. Uh, data set. Movie. OK, in data set, I want to read the data from there. That's why I'm using the word in. Which link service? This one is the link service. OK, so it has gone to that data set. Uh, no, I will have to browse. Uh, into the storage account for the data set from where we want to pull the data. From here, I'm browsing. The data is inside the data container. Here it is. OK, clicking on OK. And I know that there is a first row, which is the header row there. So that row I am selecting, clicking on OK. OK, import a schema. In the first header row, there is a schema. But the column names are at least there. May not be column types, but column names are there. Clicking on OK. And now I want to see whether it has really brought the data. So for that purpose, see here. Data is a container. MovieDB.csv is a pipe. And whether I have configured the link service properly and whether I have configured data set properly, OK, that I want to verify by clicking here on the preview data. And then it has to show me. The data what it has brought. So here is the data what it has brought. So see here movie ID title. You know, uh, genre. Uh, comedy say year, OK, rating and uh, other columns. So I'm getting the data. It means my uh, data set has been created properly. Now the next thing what I want to do is that I will apply the transformation on this data and transform the data. I would like into I would like to write into storage. OK, so for that purpose again, another data set I will have to create. For that purpose, again, I click here. Integration data set, data set movie. Aggregation out. OK, and I will write the data into the block storage only. Block storage only. Continue. And let me write the data in the form of the JSON now. Let me just change the data format. And I want to write the data into text format to understand whether the data has been written properly or not. So I will not choose any by say option here, which will write the data into binary form. So I will not choose ORC. I will not choose Parkway. I will select JSON. Clicking on continue. So data set. Data set. Aggregation of movie DB. OK, and out. Out means we will write the data. So remember here, data sets for in purpose are different than data sets for out purpose. Now, link service you can use for read and write both, but the data data set that you are using for read purpose, you cannot use it for write purpose. Okay, and that's why you have to create another data set here for the same link service. Let me. Okay. Uh, yes, in the same uh, container, I can write the data. So I maybe you know browsing. So I will like I would like to write the data in the same container. So I am giving a path up to container only. OK, and file name I can give here. I want it to write the data. OK, in the specific file name. So I may write aggregation. Agree.json some file name I am giving. But now see this file is not existing as of now. It will have to write that data into the file. And what columns it will write that will depend on what are all transformations we will uh, apply on the data so that schema of the data is not yet decided. OK, and that's why 
this file is not existing, so it cannot import a schema. And its schema is not anywhere existing, so I will have to select. So as of now, the schema is not existing. Whatever transformations we will apply from there, it will create a schema and then it will write the data. And after this, then we will have to create. So the, both these data sets, let me publish and let me commit the changes what we have done. Those I am publishing. The next thing is now we will have to create one pipeline. OK, this pipeline I can put to run whenever I want or this pipeline can be scheduled also and I can, you know, uh, schedule this pipeline to run uh, six o'clock every day evening. So that way I can schedule it. OK, so now I'm coming to this integrate and here I will ask it to create one pipeline. Here it is. OK. Pipeline name, let me change. Movie transform. Pipeline movie transform. OK, this I am collapsing. And here I have to create one data flow. Okay. I want to create one data flow. So all these called are called as the activities. You know, in case if you are coming from data factory, you know, they might be seeing these uh, screens as a very much resemblance to data factory screen uh, screens. OK, so there is a, a data flow in data factory also. This is called as a canvas. I have dropped that activity there. OK, I will change its name. So this is actually to invoke data flow. OK, activity run data flow. Activity run data flow. Hmm. Is the name I am giving to that activity. OK, and which data flow it will run so that I can set from here settings. And I don't have a data flow. I will have to create a data flow so that I can create from here. Plus new. OK, so here now it has taken me to the canvas where I can create a data flow. My pipeline, which I just have created, is appearing here under this tab. My you know, data set in is appearing here. Data set out is appearing here. And now let me design a data flow. So this is the data flow to apply transformation on uh, movie data. OK, so. Data flow. OK, transform. Movie. Data. OK, so that is its name. Fine, the very first thing is in order to apply the transformation, I need to pull the data. I need to bring the data. So here I will add a source and this source will decide from where we have to bring the data. There I am clicking. I will do one more thing. Uh, OK. Source. The so source is the storage. Source is the storage. OK. Uh, what is it? Chandra PP203 store. OK, Chandra. Some name I can give. Chandra DP203. And I have to bring the data from the integration data set. OK, and that data set I have to select from here. Here it is. So here it is. It will bring the data. OK, and if I want to check. Whether the data has reached here or not. You know, for that purpose, this particular activity I will have to run. And for that purpose, I have to create a compute here. OK, so I am selecting here. OK, and I will give a compute size and I will use this compute for next one hour. OK, so I will go with this uh, configuration. OK, and now it will start that compute. Remember this compute when it needs to run uh, the steps of what I will create here and I will run those steps immediately to verify whether those steps I have configured properly or not. So it will start the compute internally and it is using a Spark engine to run these steps. So again, you know, Spark engine is not still leaving you here in even in data factory also. <clears throat> so let it start. Uh, the compute engine.
<clears throat> and after that, then we will see data preview. OK, and there we will see the data also. Other options. Wildcard path are not applicable here. Uh, yes, this option is applicable. And in this option, I can decide the data types. Like here, I want to convert year into integer so that I can ask it to convert. I want the rating also to be converted into integer. So those kind of, you know, changing the data columns, types of data, uh, types of the columns, you know, those, those type of transformations it allows. OK, so I have changed it there. Other things I don't need to change. Uh, OK, movie column. Uh, we may not need. OK, so is there any way I can drop this column? Somewhere I will get that way also. OK, as of now, uh, there is no way to drop that column. Uh, OK, I'm simply changing the types here. OK, so my debug engine is still getting provisioned. Anything in the optimize single partition. Okay, use the current partition. OK, fine. I don't want to change anything here. And then I will have to. Uh, see the preview of the data. OK, let it get it uh, loaded. In the meantime, let me add another activity. So I'm clicking on this plus sign. OK, to add another activity. And in another activity, what I will do is uh, I have got the data. OK, so in another activity, I may. Um, go with aggregate. Just a minute. Next activity I can do on the data. Let me just verify. <laughs> Filter. Filter for years. Let me delete this activity and let me add a filter activity there. So filter activity will allow me to select the rows of specific uh, condition, meeting specific condition. So filter on year is the name I am giving to that activity. Filter on year range. I will give some specific range that I will would like to you know, take only those records ahead which are within the specific range. OK, so this is done. I go here. I want to see the data. Has it brought the data? Let me just uh, you know, go there and check data preview for the first activity. OK, and let me refresh it. And now let me see is it bringing the data. Not only it has to bring the data, it has to you know, uh, transform those two columns into integer. So let me check. Is it uh, a flying transformation also? <clears throat> but try to see here on the data we can apply different and different uh, transformations without writing the code. This is called as a codeless approach of transformation. Okay. And here you see. This movie column, it is of text type. ABC represents text. Title represents text. Genre represents text. But year is representing integer. Rating is representing integer. It means type transformations have been done properly. Type trans Otherwise, you know, if you don't do type transformations, it would have shown you all these things as a string. So type transformation also is successful. Now let me uh, define a filter and let me define a condition. You know uh, exactly which records we want. You know where clause brings uh, only those records which are uh, you know abiding the condition. So this is like a where clause. <clears throat> OK, add expression for the filter. So filter on here. I will have to click on any. OK, and I will have to write the expression there. OK, so I want all those records. Um, uh, to uh, take a head for whom that release is. From 2010, sorry, 1910 onwards. 
okay, in between 1910 to 1986. Only those records I wanted to uh, pick up. So here I will select year. So I can generate expression without writing or without typing also. Year greater than equal to 1911 and year face year year less than maybe say 2000 that is the expression i will write okay and i am clicking on uh, refresh okay and let us see is it able to show me the data <coughs> which will meet that condition no, it is not able to show me. It is showing me the year, but whether it will include that data, it has to show me either cross or right. So that is also a bug they will have to, you know, fix. Okay, I am clicking on save and finish. Okay, but here I want to see whether it has brought the data or not. Okay, if you see here, you know, in year negative year also it is bringing. Okay, it is 1902 which is not meeting the condition. Let me see here and in data preview. Let me see. Is it able to show me that data which is meeting that condition? And see here. Record of minus 1980 has gone. Record of 1902 that also has gone. And here only you will see those records which are having year between uh, 1911 uh, up to 2000, only those records you will see. So your filtration is appearing properly. Now you want to do the aggregation on the year and calculate average of the rating. For a grouping, you will use year, and for uh, aggregation, you will use average of rating. So how do you do that? So for that purpose, you have a transformation here for doing a grouping. Aggregate. Aggregate here. Huh. OK. So. Aggregate on year. Agree. On year. OK. Uh, and AVG. On rate ratings. OK, so I want it to do group by on the year column. So here, just a minute, let me take it. Okay. Select the column. Here. Expression builder. Select the column here. Okay, save and finish. Year name as column year HG year. Okay, and then I will have to go to aggregate hereby. I have asked it to look group as per the year, and after grouping, I want it to. Uh, group by AGG year by name and uh, fine AGG year grouped by AGG year and here I will mention rating and expression average average so function. Here is a function. I want to apply AVG function, average function. Yes. And I want to apply that function on column names. Okay, column names rating. How do I get the column names? It puts schema. No, parameters. Where are column names? Okay, here. Yes, fine. Done. So it will do grouping on the year, and for every group of the year, it will give me average of the rating. 
finally means i will have a look at this data so for that purpose i go to data preview and i refresh the data here to identify is it able to you know uh, aggregate the data properly and create average so for 1915 this is the average of the rating so it is able to uh, calculate average group the records and calculate average it is able to. this data i want to write into some file for that purpose here i will have to declare a data sync so i will declare a data sync now okay this is a, going to be a last state okay and data will go into the storage that's what i want it to do okay so maybe uh write to file write to store yes indic uh, integration data set out data set i already have created so that name let me mention here yes so i want it to write to the out data set test connection i already have tested it earlier i believe it will work here also connection is successful okay so that data it has to write to store any other setting i have to do file name option no i i think in data set i already have given a file name optimize and here i will i have to ask it to use a single partition remember by default it uses many many partitions and then it will end up creating so many files because every partition creates one file of the data that is being written you know it is a hadoop like uh, concept okay and that's why i have to select for single partition with that now okay i have done necessary configuration i click on data preview to see the data <coughs> and then we will have to put it to run to see in the storage okay this is the data what it will write whenever it will run this uh, data flow it will write this data to the disk okay uh, with that what next thing i will have to do is to publish all the things so i have created a pipeline here that is yet not published i have created a data flow that is also uh, to be published so pipeline and a data flow so i will uh, commit uh, the changes made into both these components okay and there after then i will put pipeline to run the publishing is done now let me put pipeline to run so i may be clicking on you no know, add a trigger so trigger now trigger now means it will run this pipeline uh, immediately so when i click on trigger now you know there is not, no input i have to give i am clicking on okay so remember here i am putting this pipeline to run what this pipeline will do it will run that data flow and that data flow will read data from movie db it will apply filtration over there it will apply uh, aggregation over there it will apply uh, data writing to the disk okay and whenever your pipeline execution is successful you know as of now it is doing that if you want to monitor that execution here you can go okay pipeline run here you can monitor that execution okay and here it is showing you that the the pipeline execution is still in progress pipeline execution is still in progress okay <laughs> fresh huh. okay it is going to take a longer time because uh, you know it has to provision the compute to run these things and then it has to uh, you know apply all those steps in the data and whenever it is successful then we will go to the storage and to check whether it has written the data there or not let us see what input it has given to that activity
okay data set parameters it has given data flow data set parameters data flow details if i click on this spec it will take me to the data flow details okay and here you can you can see four steps you know to you know all the execution also you can monitor from here and as of now what it is showing me that right to store is queued means examination sorry execution of four three steps have been done it will show me status of all the uh, steps also okay, but fourth activity uh, it is uh, still uh, processing <clears throat> in the meantime let me go to storage to check you know whether something has been created there or not not yet nothing it has created okay so we will have to wait for completion of these steps OK, but this is the way you can create a data flow. You can create a pipeline. And even complex pipelines, you know, bringing data from 10 different data sources, accumulating it at one place, applying different and different transformations over there. You know, not all transformations in case if are possible through data flow. Then it may be invoking a notebook. You know where you are custom, you have customized your transformations in the form of the PySpark commands. From here, you can invoke that. Achha, see, this is successful. This has been successful. And the details of every step you can see here. Uh, every step, how much uh, you know, cal rows it has calculated, how much byte of data it has processed. That also you can see here. I am taking you to the storage. Okay, and somewhere now it has to. Show me the data. Part merged JSON. OK, I did try giving some file name to it. It did not pick up that file name. OK, but let me show you the data from this file. Okay, edit. And see for every year, uh, aggregation of the rating is appearing there. For every year, aggregation of the rating is appearing. You know, data may not be ordered in the ascending order of year. OK. But otherwise, you are getting the expected result here. That's how you know data pipelines also can be designed. OK, uh, it's a time for you now to put the questions. Let me just check. Have I received any question? Reload the page. Share your feedback on. Achha, that is the message Chaitani has given. Go ahead with a question, if any. Or otherwise, uh, we will go to have a look at uh, some of the sample questions. OK, it seems there are no questions. OK. The next thing I want to uh, do is to take you through some of the. Sample questions. This is the last activity uh, for today from my side. And then you will uh, submit the feedback. That will be the last activity from you. OK, you in case if you have a question. OK, you can forward those questions to Chaitali so that you know Chaitali will accumulate multiple questions and uh, share with me so that me or whoever be available uh, to create the answers of those questions, you will receive the answers. First question. 
read the question carefully and you will realize this is a question not of the data warehouse it is a question of the database read the question carefully Okay. Somebody has given some answer. Let me check. No. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I have received answer like A, and I do not agree with it. Let me read the question and let us arrive to the correct answer. You have a table. Table has was created using Transact SQL. Ensure that user can identify the current manager of employee. Current manager of employee. So manager himself is an employee. So identifying one employee from the another employee or reaching from one employee to the another employee in the same table. You know, that is what we will have to do. Support creating an employee reporting hierarchy for your entire company. So manager of an employee, manager of the manager, you know that hierarchy you want to create. Provide a path lookup of manager's attributes such as name and job title. Which column should you add to the table? Now here you will see. Sir D. Yes, somebody is uh, giving uh, you know, answer uh, as a self join. And yes, this is an answer of the self join. Now try to find the correct answer. This is an, uh, a problem of the self join. Now you whether you can find the correct answer, let me know. Yes. So Sai has given a correct answer and it is C. Now see, this is an example of self join for every employee. See employee key. OK, is representing unique identity for the employee. And I have to add one more column here, which will represent manager of that employee. And manager of that employee will be employee key of the manager. The type of the manager of the employee, okay, and employee key, INT, INT, they those, those must be same. And that's why answer is. Okay, so here, why you will select, why you will not select A? Because the type is different. Why you will not select B? Type is different. Not D, type is different. But C as type is same. It's an example of self referencing table. OK, next question. I already have given answer of this question to you.
Sai has given answer as A. Diksha has given no. Acha. Sai has changed his answer to B. Now let me explain you. Let me read the question. You know, this is the question uh, of, uh, you know, open the row set. In open the row set, whenever you mention the location, okay, and there you mention the path, bulk, and then the whole path. When you query external table using Azure Synapse Analytics serverless SQL pool, which files are returned? For what? Whenever you are mentioning location as a top folder, then which files are returned? Now inside a top folder, how to know files are external from diagram? See, these are all external files only. Always remember, you know, serverless SQL pool cannot you know, represent managed files. All these are external files only. Okay, so all these are external files and whenever you are mentioning this uh, particular folder, you know, there in case if you are not mentioning asterisk, asterisk after this, then what it will do, it will not recursively traverse these folders, not recursively traverse these folders. So as asterisk asterisk are not mentioned, what it will do, this CSV file and this CSV file, only these two CSV files it will pick up. And it will not go inside a folder one and folder two, and it will not find out these files. Okay, so fold file one and file four, that answer is correct. So answer B is correct here. Let me show you correct answer. Answer B, note, if location, Top folder slash asterisk asterisk files would have been listed you know, recursively and answer C would have been correct. All files it would have been uh, traversed. Okay, but as asterisk asterisk are not mentioned, it will directly refer to the files existing inside top folder. Have I explained that uh, answer? Let me know, please. Hello. Huh. <clears throat> Taking you to the next um, question now. Question three. Report one. Read three columns from the file that contains 50 columns. Okay, only three columns are to be uh, uh, are needed, not all 50 columns. Okay, so report one asks you to choose the data format that is column major. So now you recall which data format is column major. Report two, query the single record based on the timestamp. So report two asks you to choose a single record. So it must be row major. So from the different data formats, so try to recall which data format are column major and which data format are row major. Okay, but whenever the report two is also asking you to pick up the record based on the timestamp. So that timestamp word is again very important. Okay, for report one, now what will be the correct answer you would like to go with? Which kind of data format, you know, uh, represents uh, uh, column major here? Parkway. Remember, Avro is not column major. Avro is the default uh, data format in case of Hadoop. No, Avro is not column major. And in Avro, there are two important things. Your data goes binary in the row major format, but metadata goes in text format in form of a JSON. But Avro initially it stores a JSON which represents a metadata, and after that it represents binary data. Okay, timestamp goes there. Timestamp is another uh, you know interesting feature for Avro. Okay, so Avro has a timestamp as a data type. Okay, so wherever you are representing a timestamp, there you know you can uh, prefer going with the Avro. 
So the answer to the first question is the Parkway and Sai, you are correct. OK, its answer is Parkway. Now, what answer do you think of the report two? Absolutely right. Answer to the second question is Abru because neither CSV nor Parkway nor TSV, they do not have timestamp as a data type. They do not have a timestamp as a data type. Okay, only Abru has a timestamp as a data type. And very few data types are there in Abru. You know, text, uh, integer, a double, and a timestamp. I think Boolean is also there. I am not able to recall, but there are very few uh, data types there. Out of these, all other data types are very common. You know, timestamp is something unusual because that data type is not available in other data formats. Going to the next question, uh, going to the answer. Here it is, Parkway and Agro. And now the next question. This question is little bit difficult and perhaps uh, beyond whatever you know, we have covered. OK, let us try to answer it. Part of this question, you know, I try to cover. Like uh, explaining you the directory structure. Users will query data by using variety of the services, including data bricks and Synapse Analytics serverless SQL pool. Data will be secured by subject area. Most queries will include data from the current year or current month. Current year or current month. So Queries will not include data day wise. It will not include data day wise. It will include data either by year or month. OK, and security you have to main, main, mention as the subject area. Huh. Now see here. Uh, Answer is uh, D. I think answer is D here. So you are correct. Answer is D. Now why answer is D? First of all, you know what happens is in order to maintain the security. You know, uh, subject area, for example. I am from the Mumbai say and I am entitled to view the data of the Mumbai area only. OK, so in that case, then what uh, you know, security we can add here? that I can access the data of that specific secure subject area only and other areas will will be not visible to me. OK, so very first folder should be, you know, where we want to add the secure. So either this record or this record. One of the two. But in this record, you know, we want year wise data. Include data from year or month, every query include data from year or month. So this is the correct answer and this is not a correct answer because it is beginning with a D. OK, so uh, D is the correct answer. Always remember. That it should get. Uh, precise the data. It should get a precise data in the path. Now here, whenever it is going into the path, you know, year is later, but initially only whenever in your query there is no DD, which folder to uh, should it go to? You know, there will be you know 30, 31 folders there. Which folder to uh, should it go to? That's why this directory structure is not correct. Okay, here in case if I want uh, data of 1964, it will go into 1964 folder. Okay. Then it will go into the month. In case if I have mentioned a May month, it will go into the May month. And there it will bring whole data from there. OK, so step by step it is going into the folder structure. OK, and there and then that's why uh, answer D is correct. Answer D is correct. 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन so there will be questions on data formats okay and that also uh, seems to be an important topic so column format columnar format and json with a time stamp i think no no this is not a repeat question the question was different earlier okay although answers may be same but problem statement is different so this is not a repeat question which data format supports a columnar format same answers correct json with a time stamp i did explain you about avro okay and in avro i told you uh, that uh, you know uh, metadata is written in the json format and actual data is written in the binary format but your data always go as a row major there uh, so uh, answer to the columnar format is parkway and answer to the uh, json with a time stamp it is avro these are answers mentioned there gzip gzip is like a zipping uh, encryption it is like a zipping encryption you do zipping and unzipping right so it is like a zipping en encryption next question now this question is based on uh, uh data factory or uh, synapse pipeline so in case if you are from that background you will find uh, answering this question easy <clears throat> files are initially ingested into azure data lake store account as 10 small json files each file contains same data attribute and data from subsidiary of your company you need to move the files to different folders and transform the data to meet the following requirements files are initially ingested into azure data lake storage it provides the fastest possible query time automatically infers a schema for underlying files how should you configure data factory copy activity you need to move files to the different folders you should move the files to different folders it is not merging of the file but you have to move the files to different folders the sai merge file option is not correct flatten hierarchy and merge files you know they move your data to same folder that is to be noted the preserve hierarchy can move your data to different folder so preserve hierarchy is the correct answer here okay sync file type then small json files each file contains same data attribute uh, automatically infer the schema from underlying files sync file type so let us have a look at the answers here <coughs> 
पपी बिहेवियर प्रिजर्व हायर एंड सिंग पाइल टाइप पार्क वे वाई पार्क वे प्रोवाइड अ फास्टेस्ट पॉसिबल क्वेरी टाइम दैट्स वाई इट इज कॉम्प्रेस्ड येस प्रोवाइड अ फास्टेस्ट पॉसिबल क्वेरी टाइम येस दैट्स वाई पार्क वे गोइंग अहेड हाँ अगेन दिस क्वेश्चन आंसर टू दिस क्वेश्चन हैज बीन डिस्कस्ड सो वुड लाइक यू टू आंसर इट Team customer. Now this name itself is suggesting me that this is the dimension table, and I already told you which uh, you know sharding pattern to apply on the dimension table. So please select appropriate sharding pattern from there for team customer. Recall for dimension table, which kind of uh, sharding pattern did I suggest? Dimension tables are small in size. They are not large in size. They should exist in every machine. They can be, uh, you know, the join can be created quickly with them. So they should exist in every machine. They should exist as they are in every machine, as they are in every machine. always remember round robin to be used only for the purpose of data migration uh to replicate is the correct answer for dim customer because you know that has to be executed in every machine okay and uh, it is not round robin because uh, there uh, you know you are not uploading the data into hash distribution there you have to use round robin as a staging Okay. What about team employee? Next question. Again, it is a dimension table, huh? And that's why uh, most probable answer is the replicated one, because that is again a dimension table. Same is the thing for team team time. Again, it is a dimension table, so most probable answer is the replicated. So dimension tables normally have a small size, and there they are measuring all the dimension tables will be less than two GB after compression. It means you know two GB is a, a kind of a threshold, which uh, normally uh, uh, use as a benchmark, you know, to decide shall we go for replication or shall we do not go for replication. so in case if your table size is less than 2 gb go for the replication fact is hash need to partition yes last has last question has answered as distribution that is 6 gb 6 tb not gb i am showing the correct answer here all dimension tables replicate all fact tables has distributed next question now this question is related to storage it is not related to synapse so read the question carefully and in case if you are aware of the storage you will be able to answer it five year old data and seven year old data Yes. Move to cool. Next archive. Move to cool storage. Move to archive. Now, five-year-old data. Move to cool. 
and seven year old data move to storage. Uh, sorry, archive. Archive is the cheapest storage. Cheapest storage among all the storages of uh, Azure. Archive is the cheapest storage. But there you cannot afford keeping every type of data because uh, getting the data back from the archive is not an immediate process. You cannot get data back from the archive immediately. It takes hours to retrieve the data from archive. So today, in case if you send a request, it, they will take uh, maybe you know two hours to fifteen hours to uh, give, give you the data. Okay, and that's why archives are used for the backup. The data that you have, you have to you, know, you have to preserve for um, long duration. There you go with an archive. Next question. Uh, just. Sorry. I think this question got repeated. Next question. At least first box you can tell me the content of the first box you can tell me because that we already have covered. Now this will be our last question. Thereafter, uh, so we will discuss uh, any question and answer. OK, and Chaitali may also uh, want to discuss some of the things with you, or you may also want to ask her uh, your queries regarding our technical areas. Yeah. So then I will conclude the session after this. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, just hold on. Uh, Manish, are you there? Yes, sir. This is the last question, sir. Ha, yeah, this is the last question. OK, OK. Just give us two minutes. <clears throat> Anybody answer? Or I will show you the answer. You know, this kind of table we did create. And while mentioning the hash uh, sharding there, what reservoir did you use? You know, that's what you have to recall here. OK, and that reservoir is distribution. So first reservoir is distribution and another is. Partition. Another is partition. OK, there is no function reservoir here. OK, so only partition. So those are the correct answer and that's all uh, from my side. I try to cover as many things as uh, I can in a uh, given time. Some of us were, are uh, were new here, and that's why you know I had to start uh, some of the things from the scratch. Okay, and I tried to take you to a fairly high level within short span of time. Uh, I tried to you know, take you uh, on the demos also. Okay, I sh did show you uh, from where you can uh, get a reference material. I did show you where you will. Uh, refer to the labs. You can get a free subscription and try your hands on or otherwise you, know, you can join some session that will provide you a scalable uh, lab like environment where you can do necessary hands on. You know, so within given time, you know, I try to uh, you know, uh, say brush your all co say concepts. That is one thing and I try to give you some of the tips and tricks regarding going for the examination. So that's all from my side. Hereby, I render in you know, a best of luck for everybody here uh, for going for the examination. And over to uh, uh, Manish. Okay, in uh, the meantime, in case if you have some questions, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, yes, Manish. You can go ahead. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, CB, sir, uh, for this wonderful session, full day session on DP203. OK, thank you all for participating uh, in this free training of uh, DP203. Uh, OK, uh, if uh, if anyone has any question uh, related to this topic, uh, please drop them into the chat box. Yes, okay. uh, Sai Kumar is asking about uh, uh, video recording. So are we planning to share this video recording link to them? For, for recording links, you, uh, uh, you need to uh, subscribe our channel. OK. 
we are uh, we have uh, all uh, recordings of our uh, sessions are there in our youtube channel everybody please, uh, please fill up feedback that is very important for us yes so, yes i am uh, sharing feedback link once again yes okay uh, meanwhile request you to please submit the feedback uh, through the provided feedback form okay i have shared uh, a link in chat box we appreciate your thoughts and suggestions as they will allow us to make improvements in our delivery and uh, in our delivering the sessions and training okay so please your feedback is valuable to us so please uh, uh, don't forget to fill feedback form I'm sharing a YouTube subscriber link also here. OK, so thanks all for your kind cooperation. Let me uh, drop myself. OK, and best of luck everybody here for going for the examination. Uh, I have shared exam voucher discount and certification training discount also. If you, uh, uh, we do provide certification training on fundamental as well as uh, advanced role based certification training. Uh, training. To know more, uh, you can uh, drop email on info at synergetics-india.com or chaitali savant at synergetics-india.com or WhatsApp at uh, WhatsApp us at. Uh, Eight two nine one six three three six two zero five eight. On this WhatsApp number, this is a WhatsApp number. You can uh, inquire on this number, okay, for paid trainings and uh, uh, ex paid exam vouchers. If you like this training, please uh, uh, mention in your uh, feedback form and. Uh, comment you can comment uh, in last section okay you can review your uh, testimonials in last section that is comment uh, section uh, pravin uh, please connect to uh, chaitali she will guide you okay okay yeah Thank you, dear. Uh, please uh, fill the feedback form before leaving. Hey. 